Welcome. 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 To celebrate. To celebrate. Holly. Welcome to celebrate story. With my mom. My mom. With my mom. With my mom. With my wife. Julie Wagner. Julie Wagner. Julie Wagner. Julie Wagner. Happy moment. We are so glad you are here to listen to today's conversation on Celebrate Story. I am so excited to have my husband, Steve Wagner, join me on the podcast again. Hello. We are going to be talking about mental health and marriage. Um, We're going to be talking about what we've been learning in our marriage. It occurred to me that we were at 25 Valentine's Days together. And my husband gave me a card describing how he's the luckiest husband in the world. I didn't give you a card this year. (laughs) I know. I was going to just make up something funny that would just be ludicrous. Um, No. Do you guys want to hear what he gave me? Actually, I was trying to make a joke and then the joke just bombed. But he got me merchandise, a shirt, a very soft t-shirt with... Celebrate Story logo on it, and a coffee mug with Celebrate Story. Well done, Wags. Well done. Thanks. You want to tell our friends and family what I got you? You got me date night supplies for active date nights. (laughs) You should probably explain. (laughs) Do you want to explain? Probably not what they're... (laughs) This racquetballs and tennis balls. <laughs> you did not. You did not just say that. Okay, you can delete all that out. Okay, that was funny. It was. Funny. It's not deleting. It's all. <laughs> it's okay. All right. Okay. So what we are discussing well, today that deserves a little further because. Okay, go for it. Date nights in the past for the last I don't know how long we've we been doing date nights now. Um, Eternity. <clears throat> Regular date nights as married couple with kids is probably, what, 12, 13, 14 years? Yes. And typically those have always centered around local breweries and drinking beer. Yes, we love to visit. But we're cutting back on that, so we need yes. something else to occupy our time. So we need different things to do. Racquetballs and tennis balls for active date night. Yes, instead of breweries around. Tra- yes, so I got... Yeah, so I was thinking, I, and I made a nice little metaphorical thing, like no matter what the weather, whether what the weather was poor or great, we'd have something to do together. Like an inside game, a friend of mine said that some of the best advice she got on her marriage was that, I think it was her husband's grandmother, was like every couple needs an inside game and an outside game for when the weather is good and when is, the weather is bad. So that was kind of the inspiration. And Steve and I have been weathering our own storms, both individually and collectively. Um, And so I thought, okay, that would be a fun gift. This is what we can, you know, have some fun inside, outside. There was also a card and a t-shirt, so. Yes. It wasn't just tennis balls and racquetballs. (laughs) Yes. It was a great gift. Great job, Julie. Good job, Julie. (laughs) Okay. So launching into today's topic, um, although that was just a perfect small talk before the real talk. Um, It was. It was perfect. Okay. So we're going to be talking about what we're learning in our marriage in regards to mental health and our marriage and how those things um, work with each other or don't work with each other. So first off, we cannot launch into all these questions to each other about our marriage before talking about how we met. Drum roll, please. Insert drum roll sound. Do you want to start off the story, Stephen Wagner? We met in college. Oh, no. That's right. He gives the short answer. We met in college, but we have to tell the story. Go ahead. Tell the whole story. You got it. How you saw me from across campus and started sprinting towards me. That was actually opposite. You saw me in the parking lot moving in. You were like, yeah, Yeah. I'm going to grab that guy. Yeah. I thought you were so cute. Okay, sophomore year, James Madison University, Harrisonburg, Virginia, both of our sophomore years. So I was 18. No, I was 19. 
And you were 18. I was. Yes, I was so much older. Older woman. Yeah. Older, wiser. It's just been that way the whole time. Um, I've got like eight weeks on him. Okay, so sophomore year, we're moving into college. We have off-campus housing that year, but it's yet like done through the campus. So it's these apartments, and we're moving into these apartments. I thought, so I saw him in the parking lot. He caught my attention, and I went to Walmart with my friend Judy, who lived on the fourth floor. I lived on the third, and she recommended a certain brand of shampoo. I got the shampoo upon her recommendation. And I got home and I was like, let me just smell the shampoo because everyone wants to know what their shampoo smells like before you actually get in the shower and use it. And it smelled funny. And so then I like squeezed it out to like put it in my hand to check it out further. I know this sounds so weird. And so I put it in my hand and it was weird. It had like chunks of almost like cottage cheese. Like curdled milk. Curdled milk. Yes. And I was like, this is odd. And so I left my apartment first day, um, got in the elevator and I could have sworn I got off on the fourth floor, but instead I got off on the second floor, second floor, which is where Steve Wagner and Dave Gorey had an apartment. And so I waltzed into what I thought was Judy Hicks's apartment, but it was not. It was Stephen Wagner's apartment. And since it was like move-in day, all the doors were just propped open. So she walked straight into our place. Yes. I don't think, yeah, I don't even think I had to open up the no. door. And, and, I was, and I was back around the corner. So you, yeah. Yeah. And I just was talking about how this shampoo was really weird. And I mean, I was just going on nonstop. And then I looked up and that was the moment he fell madly and deeply in love with me. Take it away, Steve Wagner. <laughs> I actually had the thought of, wow, that was really weird. <laughs> I hope I never run into that girl again. No, you didn't. That's, I didn't? You didn't, say, you didn't say, I hope I never run into her again. Never publicly. Now my feelings are hurt. But I'm glad I did okay. run into you again. Okay. All right. I'm recovering. But I'm you, re were, you were standing in my doorway, talking with your head down, looked up at me, and then I noticed a weird white creamy substance in your hand. That was, yeah, that was a little odd. It was strange. But you're so glad you kept running into And then me. you ran out of my place and, for, and <laughs> forgot that you had <laughs> changed floors and went into what was your apartment and who did you meet that time? Yes, because then I thought, oh, I must have just never, I, ne I, I will tell who I met, but I thought, well, I must have never gotten off like my actual floor, the third floor, and so I went into my apartment and then Paige Lawrence was laying on the floor with her feet on the wall talking to someone. And that was Paige and Leslie's apartment. And to this day, Leslie's a bestie for the restie. And then I, I said something ridiculous and walked out. But that, that's where I met all my friends. It's like, And this is what I tell our children. And I tell my children at co-op that never be afraid of something you're bad at. Because I really, I have directional insanity. Like I literally, if I'm going one way on 485, I think I'm going the right way and all my kids are screaming at me at the wrong way. This is like a regular situation. Like I cannot, I really struggle geographically. And look how well it worked out for me. I landed Stephen Wagner. That's right. Yeah. I remember a story, I think, I think we were still in college and I was talking to you on the phone it must have been after college because I don't think you had a cell phone in college. So no, I was I talking to you on the phone and you were in the car with friends and you were going from Richmond back to like Williams, Williamsburg. Yes. Which is... And, Confusing. It's really hard. It's like one and, straight shot and, and you have to pick the right way. On. And we were talking on the phone and you were like, um, hold on, I let me let me call you back. because I And I heard in the background somebody say... Did that say welcome to North Carolina? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So that you got on 95 so... going south instead of 64 going east. That is the hardest thing about life. You have to get on a road and it has to be the right direction. Plus, <laughs> North Carolina is a pretty good distance from yeah. Richmond. Yeah, it was. It was, it was far Hours. out of our way, which yes. is why I needed eight children to correct me on which way I'm going on the interstate. It sure does annoy me, though, still to this day, even though I know this about me, myself, like every time they tell me I'm going the wrong way, my gut reaction is stop telling me what to do. And then I'm like, oh, 
I am going the wrong way. Anyways, back to our story. Great supporting story, Steve. Of the, You're welcome. <laughs> the hours out of the way. So I'm going to need you to show up with some of your vulnerabilities and the things you struggle with. Like? Like? Soon in this podcast. Okay. okay. Um, There's a whole list of questions here that look fairly uncomfortable. Fairly <laughs> uncomfortable. We made those questions together. Yeah. Okay. 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 Well, so, okay. So that's the story of how we met, but we didn't start, we have to finish the story because we didn't start meeting. We didn't, like I saw him, I was extremely embarrassed that I, I mean, I I really did seem crazy. I've got like something in my hand. I'm talking nonstop. I really got embarrassed because I thought he was super cute and I turned right around. And then the next few weeks, I just hoped I'd run into him. And then he played rugby and a bunch of us that were all in the same year, all sophomores would hang out at this gazebo and we would all be down at the gazebo together. And it happened to be one time that you were inviting everybody in the group. No, am I not telling the story right? It happened in a bedroom. It happened in a bedroom? Yeah. Oh, I thought it was in the gazebo. No. Okay. Fix the story for me. Fix it, Steve Wagner. Mary Take it away. And what's her face? Beth's. Beth's bedroom. We were all... I'm glad you forgot her name because you yes, knew her name. I did know her name. Back then. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> Good move. Good move. You're, you're saving yourself. remember you were in the corners doing jumping jacks. That's right. That's right. Okay. So he comes... There's no corners in a round gazebo. That's right. That's right. So he comes in to Beth and Mary's room and invites everyone to a rugby party. party. Yeah. And of course I wanted to go. And... But... He wasn't exactly like making eye contact with me. And so I had to do jumping jacks in the corner to say, (laughs) which I didn't really do jumping jacks. I'm just, I'm teasing myself. That's one way to get an invitation to a party. (laughs) Randomly do jumping jacks in the corner. I was like, me, (laughs) me. No, you were just be. And what's funny is I interpreted your shyness as he was a snob. I was like, oh my gosh, what a snob. He thinks he's too good for me. And that drew me to you more but I had no idea that you were just shy. Like, I didn't know that. I was really shy. I so. know. <laughs> Look how far you've blossomed. <laughs> blossomed. <laughs> that was weird. Could you please cut that out? Look how far you blossomed. It was so weird. Okay. Could you just cut that out? Like, delete it? We'll see. Okay. All right. So, eventually, you asked me out. Eventually. Eventually. It was... Go ahead. How long? It was a how long? Years later he asked me out. Years. Uh-huh. <laughs> so school started what? Last end of weekend August. of August. Mm-hmm. Our first date was September fourteenth, I'm pretty sure. No. If I've got that right, I'm pretty sure. May maybe, maybe. So that's two weeks. Two weeks, yes. Uh-huh. <sighs> yes. And then he took me to dinner at Ruby Tuesdays and I insisted that I pay because I was a strong independent empowered woman that was not going to be dependent on a man. Yeah. And, and he, I haven't heard the end of it because <laughs> I let her, I split the check with her. Yes. And then I was so mad that he, <laughs> it was so confusing. That it was sociology of women crew were a yeah. intimidating bunch. It was, it was very, I hadn't even taken that class yet. Yes. Okay. So that, that's, that's the basics of how we met. And then once we, we fell in love after that, and then we were just together all the time. Yep. Just ask our roommates. Yes. I'm, that didn't annoy them at all, I'm I, sure. We were so disrespectful to our roommates, like, so disrespectful, because we were just so in we, love. We've been punished with it, with our eight kids, though. Yes. Because they're disrespectful of our roommates. Yes, that's true. <laughs> it's true. We, we, We've paid for it. We see the error of our ways. Um. Okay, so jumping more into the meat of the discussion. So that's how we met. Um, Okay, so mental health and marriage was one of the things we wanted to focus on. Um, And Steve and I have spent a few years talking about, like, between us, codependency. Um, One of the things that we wrestle with is both being like, I tend to be a pleaser. He tends to merge to what I want. And so we're kind of lost in this space somewhere in the middle because we're both trying to please and merge to the other one's desires. And then it's like, then the children are running away with what we're doing. Is is that a fair summary? Yeah. Yeah. So we've been on a journey um, ever so slowly of learning to, you know, stay connected to ourselves and, and not be dependent on what the other person wants is 
wants, but showing up with our own needs and our own wants and our own feelings. And that's, that's been a journey. Um, that's been a, that's been a big journey. Um, I think, you know, you and I have said before, it was at a brewery, I think one time that we saw a picture of this really lonely kid and it, it kind of dawned on us both. And we got in a discussion about like, we both grew up though we were surrounded by people, both really connected with the idea of being lonely as a child. And that, you know, I think was a big, deep reason why we wanted a large fem- family. Um, and then, you know, these these issues of codependency don't just like magically disappear just because you're a grown up. It, it takes hard work. So what do you think, Steve, is what what we are learning or what you are learning. Listen to me, what we are learning here. I am being codependent again. What are you learning about codependency in our marriage here the last couple of years? I think one, it, I think the main thing is it's my, not my responsibility. Um, while it's, I can do things to help it. It's not my responsibility, whether you are happy or content or, um, I can't take that on to myself because it's, I can't do anything about it. I mean, I can be kind and loving and present and communicate with you and things like that. But overall, you're responsible, you're responsible for your happiness as I am responsible for my happiness. Um, one of the biggest things I've learned about trying to make that change is that it's really hard. Um, it's, I can equate it to a few months ago, I went golfing and I used to golf all the time. I used to almost weekly. Um, when I was a teenager, I would play three, four times a week. Um, so I played a lot, but I haven't played a lot recently. Maybe, I don't know, a couple times over the last four or five years. Um, but I went recently and I started playing and I played really well. Um, which was a surprise, but it, it, it comes down to muscle memory where it just, I pick up the club and I start to swing it and it just, things kind of fall into place. Well, I think interactions with people are the same way. Mm -hmm. When somebody says something, you tend to react a certain way and being, and the older you get, the more you've done it and the harder it is to break that muscle memory of how you're going to react to that person or to those people or to that situation. I love that metaphor because it is muscle memory. You and I with our codependency, why do you think it hits us now? I mean, I know it's typical. I hear from so many couples, like once things settle with the little years, like there's a new phase in your marriage. And I know even research shows at this point in our marriage, it ends up being, you know, new challenges, new storms, new hiccups. But it's like, why was that codependent pattern something that kind of almost helped us, that muscle memory memory of codependency? It almost helped us while like in the thick of having babies and being pregnant. And then now it seems to be like, that dance no longer works for us. Why is that? Like what? I don't know. I I think part of it is when we have a disagreement or an argument or a fight or whatever you want to call it, and the dust settles and we get to reconciliation and you think back and you're like, we've had that fight before. We've had that disagreement before and we've had it lots of times. And it's just... Why are we continuing to have the same, even though there are different circumstances, different content, the same core arguments over and over and over and over again? Yes. Um, And I think it goes to that. It's your natural, your, your response that's been built into you from whatever period of time people would argue from toddlerhood, um, that you start to respond a certain way and it just, and for whatever reason, those two responses, your response and my response clash and it's, and we, and it's kind of stuck there. So doing the work, going to therapy and I think we both, we've both gone to therapy and our therapists separately who don't know each other and are actually have two different styles completely 
had basically told us, you guys need to take care of yourself. <laughs> 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 that, that it's, it's important for you to figure out what's important to you and to, um, not merge with the other person. Mm-hmm. I love how you touched on, cause you started talking about the visual that came to my mind when you were talking about these patterns that start way early in life. Like I remember my therapist said once, it's like, you've got two adults when they're in this like conflict cycle, you both are battling against the other person's childhood trauma. You're not battling against this other adult with their grown up tools, you're using childlike tools, dealing with your childlike trauma. And then kind of like marrying that with what I'm really intrigued with Esther Perel, how she talks about all fights are over three things, either power control, safety and security, or esteem and affection. And that helps so much because I remember I can't even remember the details of the argument that we had had, but it was like, I could start to see it from a different lens that I was, I was fighting for esteem and affirmation. And you were fighting, I think in that one for control. Those three things line up with the three Enneagram triads if you're an Enneagram person. But I realized that is a lot of the energy behind a, an argument for me sometimes. It's about esteem and affection. It's like, this is what I, this is what I, I couldn't put words to it, but it's like hearing that gives me a different lens to consider. So. Yeah. And I think when, when I get into, I don't know, I, we're very different emotionally. Um, the way we process emotions, the way we, well, really the way we kind of process everything. I, pra- I process internally, you process externally. You want to talk everything out and... I want to I want to talk but I I want to develop my thoughts beforehand. Um no you know I don't think either way is right or wrong or better or worse. Um that's just the way we kind of process it. So if we're in an argument if we have something going on control ends up being a big thing for me because mm-hmm. I'm trying to process internally as I have an ex- where you're trying to process externally. So I have an, an internal conversation going on while I have this external stimula coming at me and my head, I go into chaos mode. Mm-hmm. And when I get into chaos, I really want to shut down and get away. Like it, it, I want to run away. Um, and we've also worked a little bit into the distancer and pursuer, um, where in a situation like that, I become a distancer. I want to run away where you want to pursue at that point you go into pursuit Mm -hmm. and it's, you know, whatever you can take to pull me back to, to start communicating while I need, while I'm trying to run away or just distance myself to get a hold of the emotions that are going on inside of me. Yes. And that, that helped me to understand some of those terms because I didn't understand, of course, 25 years ago when we first started dating, I didn't understand how much I needed to process out loud. And I didn't understand how in stress I seek connection and I love that you were like, it's not right or wrong because it's like, I wish I, knew that 20 years ago, because I did think, I mean, I think we all do this. You think the way you do it is the right way, except for you. You always think about how everybody does it differently. That comes naturally to you. But but I think in the end, I end up thinking I'm doing it the right way. That's yes. Yes. But I'm just saying you're, you're, you tend <laughs> to be see the multiple sides, but I still have a hard time not understanding why people don't do it your way. See it like I see it. You're just more than anyone I know, so willing to listen to all sides. Um, But just knowing those terms, which that gets into attachment styles, because I have an anxious attachment style. So I, you know, and this starts early, what you were talking about early in childhood, like from early on in child, I had this anxious, like drawing towards people. 
and from early on in childhood, you have a withdrawing attachment style. And it's like that. And I think that's where learning about the codependency helps because kind of me learning, I feel like that that's been a lot of pro- progress for me to understand you need that space. And I'm growing and giving you that space and you're growing and understanding I need that connection and saying, okay, I want to talk about that. I'm going to circle like you did that just last week. I, I can't do that right now. Let's circle back to that. And then you came back to me and talked about it, which built, built so much trust. Um, that is, oh my goodness. I feel like this is all just like really, we're trying to summarize like so many things <laughs> and not that any of these have like cleared it all and we've got it all figured out. We're really just kind of discussing what we're learning now. And it is what we're learning now. Like we really started, you've been exploring things for years from a, I don't know if I have a better word than like self-help type of self-exploration books again. Communication, psychology. Yeah. I mean, it goes back to you read nonfiction. Um, That's your, that's your jam. Um, But a lot of, the stuff we're talking about now is, and I know the work that I've done um, from a therapy standpoint is all within the last year um, that, and it really, it came from a it, breaking points of just through our 20 plus years of marriage, we've had, you know, we've opened and closed a business. We've moved to a different town. We've had eight kids. We've, been in foreclosure we've been in i mean buried a parent buried yeah been at, been at the yeah so side I, by side my sister while burying a child a, a nephew um so just, many hard things yeah it's it, it hasn't been easy and we didn't talk a lot no i mean we we closed a business basically destroyed ourselves financially um we barely had conversations about it Mm-mm. i mean it was and I think a lot of that there was a lot of built just, up through well, the years. And I think both, yeah, it built up. It's like left. It's stuff we buried that is like growing. And I think and it was easy to do because we were busy. One, we were trying babies. to survive. <laughs> like when we closed the business, it was like who gets a job first. It was literally the 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 movie Mr. Mom. I really just dated myself, but <laughs> we were basically applying for jobs everywhere and. Um, whoever got the job first went to work and you got the job first and Mm -hmm. I was home with the kids for a while. So it's, um, yeah, I mean, it was, it was, we we were so busy and in such crisis that we just put our heads down and made it through. And I think it's like one of the best and the worst things about us as a couple is you and I both have like a commitment to positivity of put our heads down and let's just keep going. And then it like teeters into toxic positivity. Like you and I both are just like, oh, it'll be fine. <laughs> we got this. Sure, we'll have another kid. Maybe it'll be twins. <laughs> we just, we tend to look very optimistically at things for better and worse. That it's sometimes the best quality and sometimes the worst quality. And I, and really we were just replicating what we know. Like it's all we knew. We didn't, those weren't, I think our generation really is changing, right? Like, I'm sure our parents talked a lot more than their parents did. And it's like, these things are becoming so popular. Um, Goodness, there's so many stories we could go into about the business closing and all of that. But it made me think, when you were listing some of these hard things that we've had in our marriage, like, I would say for me, and I'd be curious if you would agree that the last two years in our marriage, all the things from COVID, from you working at home, to saying goodbye to the baby years, to um, healing from some of the the community hurts, you know, our faith changing and like rearranging all, all these things, like physical. I mean, we physical changes, yeah, physical just health things. Health things, right? They're, the last two years, I I feel like they have been, without a doubt, for me, the biggest doozies of our lives. Yeah. I mean, it's been, it's been hard. Yeah. That, um, and it, it's like, and cause I, I wanted to hit on that. I wanted to camp on that because it's like change does come from pain. Like we don't just, 
we're motivated to change from the pain and from the really, really hard places. And to me, that connects to the whole conversation of both marriage and mental health. Like for me, my mental health journey is like cycles, like seasons. Like I go through winters, I go through springs, I go through summers. And it feels like overall, like it's unfortunate that both our marriage has been in a winter at times, like a long winter. And I know my mental health has had some long winters within that too. And when that all collides, it just, I mean, spring always follows winter, but it, to me, that's what makes it like really tough. I don't know. I just, I wanted to, to throw that metaphor and, you know, I can't resist a metaphor. (laughs) Yeah. And I think it's also, we want to be honest and to, um, we're not experts sitting here by any stretch stretch of the imagination. Oh, I am. I'm a narratologist. You're a narratologist. Yes. Did you did you not listen to the introduction? Oh, I did. <laughs> just, I forgot. Sorry, I was looking for some laughter. But yeah, no, we're not experts. We're not experts. We're just kind of working things out. Yes, and we're we've been working things out sitting in our you know chairs in our front window. Um, and now we're just working things out on a microphone. Yeah. And we're starving for these conversations, which yes. is why we do it, right? We're starving for the places of the haven't yet figured it out. Like we are over filled with the 10 steps to a perfect marriage, books, blogs, posts, sermons, and conversations. Like, and we are starving for the me too. Yep. It's tough. It's tough. This is this is what we're learning. And so I think that's where, and it has been this like unexpected thing because really the podcast started as like, I wanted to keep giving birth to something and I love to storytell and you were just, you were a raving fan. I mean, you ordered the mics immediately. <laughs> like you just, you, I mean, that's one of your gifts. You were like, you, you rally the troops, you rally your resources and support me in ways that are just... I just, I can't quite articulate. And it's like you supported it. And then it became this place of like, okay, this is a life giving place for us together. Yeah. Yeah. It has been a good exercise to work together and have a common goal. Um, that isn't cause well, that sounds weird because I guess we have a common goal of raising our kids and doing all that kind of stuff. But we have a saying between Julie and I of like, we'll just look, you know, kind of look at each other every once in a while. And one of us will just be like, it feels like Groundhog Day. Again, I may be dating myself again with a movie. That's okay. You know, our target market is 43 year olds. (laughs) Or, you know, Bill Murray wakes up every morning and he's living, reliving the same day over and over again. So when you get up, make coffee, homeschool kids, go to work, um, run a kid to swim practice or football practice or, Make dinner, make lunch, do bedtimes. Well, it can roll start into to... bed, wake up the next morning, make coffee. It really it can be um, mundane. Yes, and it, without adding those things that give us life, yeah, and pleasure and Not joy. That parenting and play. can't give you life, right? But, but it can easily get into this like drudgery feeling, yeah. like this midlife drudgery. Yeah. And so this has been just a life give, it, like a hobby. Like our, I guess one of our inside games, <laughs> one of our inside games, you know, it'd be so fun if there was a couple out there that wanted to talk about what they were learning in their marriage and invite them on. Cause it's like, I'd love to hear so many podcasts, just like the one I'm cr- creating, co-creating with you of like, I would love to hear that. I would love to hear the tough stories. And cause I think the more of us that do it, the more of us that show up with those like harder stories, like then we all get a little more comfortable. And it made me think, so I went to a closet creatives the other weekend that um, go back and listen to the interview with Melanie Marshall. If you don't know what a closet creative was, this experience was so life giving. It was full of joy and play and creativity and inventiveness. And she just does a phenomenal job. And I'm hoping to plan one in the spring um, for a small group of girlfriends here at the house. Like I just, I loved it and I cannot wait to go back. But what was interesting, so it was a cool mix because she also runs a group called Dismantling the Divide. And what was cool is there was like four of us that were white and I guess it was two, four, six, eight of us or eight African-Americans. Um, actually, I'm sorry, seven African-Americans and one American, now American, but had um, 
moved here from Cameroon, West Africa. And you know what? I'm probably making some assumptions about the others. So, but I'm trying to give you just like the general at glance demographics. And I, Ginger and I, uh, my friend went with me and we were so refreshed by this dynamic because it, it presented such different conversational dynamics because we all sat in this huge table together and had dinner, this creative, delicious dinner that Melanie made, and then did this, these really creative games and activities. And this is what I'm building to, but I can never just tell the quote. I have to tell the backstory. She's going to tell you that everybody there was a couple <laughs> except for her and Ginger, because I didn't go. No, that's not what I'm telling. No, that's not where you were going <laughs> with this? That's not what I'm telling. That's not what I'm I telling. I thought I was in trouble. No, no. <laughs> I'm glad that you said, you know what? I'm not comfortable with that. Go, you know, I was glad that you supported me going with a friend. Um, <laughs> do you feel guilty? Isn't it? You feel guilty. A little bit. A little bit. <laughs> Don't feel guilty. Valentine's Day themed. Everybody was it's there with their fine. husband or spouse. They were... Uh, <laughs> They're significant others. It is it was totally fine. Ginger and I <laughs> plus, that was not why I was building to this story. Back to my story. Sorry. So no no no. I love that you added that. Okay. So what was neat? Okay, so there was a really so there was one couple there that had been married 30 years, and it came out that most of us had been married quite a long time in our conversation. And then this young, young couple, she was like, We're so young. What keeps you all together? You know, we're kind of, you know, we're from the generation. She was, I think, either late. 20s. She was very young. Um, she was like, what keeps you all together? Our generation has a lot of divorce. And this man spoke up and he said, you know what? With more therapy, I think things are changing because it's becoming less of a stigma to go and get therapy, go and get counseling, admit your problems, be vulnerable. And the more we do that, the more that helps our marriage. And I was like, mic drop. Um, I just love what he had to offer in that. And I just have that hope too for our generation that it's becoming more and more acceptable to talk about these tough things. Like my goodness, like with the heaviness of COVID, can we please just shed the charade that everything is easy and perfect all the time because that that's too heavy. Um, anyways, that was a long tangent. It was a good story. It was a good story. Yeah. Okay. I good. I like that quote, and it was. Uh... I told you I was thinking about that quote the other day that you just shared about, you know, having more therapy and people and I couldn't remember where I heard it. So I'm glad oh, you told it. It's I stuck. Okay, good. Because I was like, because you know, like, where did I hear that from? Yes. Okay. Well, I'm glad it was from you. I Thanks for encouraging that because I was like, he might need to delete that out. Anyways. Okay. This, it, not even that we told anything super vulnerable, but I'm sweating because it felt very vulnerable. Um, but this is just a start, a start to be in this space of saying, we don't have it all figured out. We're struggling sometimes too. And we're hoping um, that we can transform our pain more instead of transmitting it. Well, I think it helps to Wait, that was a great quote. Don't skip past that one. I'm sorry. I did that thing where you're not you're thinking about the next thing you're going to say and you're not really listening to the person talking to you. I know, and I was building before that quote like I just hope we can transform our pain more than transmit it. But I want to hear what you said too. Can we do both? Yeah. Okay. That was a great quote. Thanks. I listened to it the second time you just said it. <laughs> okay, now tell me what you were going to say. I think it's a I think it's a good idea. I don't know. I remember when you first started doing the Enneagram um, and getting into that. And I read one of the books um, and just learned a little bit more about it. And there's something that has, the Enneagram has nine types, basically personality types. They don't necessarily call it a personality test, but it's a... Nine it, different ways of seeing the world. There you go. Nine different ways of seeing the world. And when you think of how many people in the world there are, and you you start to read the type that you identify with, and you realize there's something comforting in realizing that there are millions upon millions of other people who see the world the same way you do and experience the same way you do and has have similar issues and concerns and thoughts. And there's something comforting in that. And I know recently, um, a friend of mine was sharing... Him and his wife were on the way home from an uh, um, activity together, and they were arguing about something. It doesn't matter what it was. And she wanted to get out of the car. Like, whatever the argument was, she she just wanted to get out of the car um, to the point that 
while the car was moving, she would like open the door and he was like really freaked out about this, which of course that'd be, it's if you're warming. driving down the road and somebody opens your door, it's that, that's scary. <laughs> but I said, and I hope it's okay if I of share course. this. I, I was you've like, already asked for permission. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Julie's done that <laughs> a couple yep. times. Um, but, and I said, but I said, I'm not I, proud of it. I just want to add that. I'm not proud of it. I said, I get it. Like, in that situation, the person driving a car has control. And if you're in an argument, you typically are you're clawing for control. Mm-hmm. In that. So the person's driving and they're, you know, that they, they have that sense of control already. So being a passenger in the car, I would imagine the only what could be the only sense of control you can get is I'm getting out. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not going with you. I'm not sitting here and arguing with you anymore. I want out of here. Like you're not controlling where I go. So, and after I share, you know, I shared it, it, we were in a group. So the conversation went on a little bit and he came back and he was like, I really appreciate you sharing it because I thought. Like something was like, something was wrong with her. Mm -hmm. And I think Isn't just something knowing, wrong with all of us. Yeah, like just knowing <laughs> somebody else has been through it, done through, done mm-hmm. the same thing, gives you some peace of mind of okay, this is something this is, that's yeah, because it's so easy normal. to think. You know, we live in a world edited to perfection with perfect Valentine's Day photos. And it's so easy to assume that they never have that bad fight where their wife wants to jump out and walk on the golf course instead of staying in the car. And I love that. Yeah. Share away any crazy things I've done um, because. I mean, I've, you know, when we've been in the house and I just couldn't, and we might be arguing. I mean, I've jumped in the car and peeled out of the driveway and gotten out. Like, yeah. it's, it's just sometimes. It's just a flood. It's yeah. like past your window of tolerance. Your nervous system is like done. Yeah. You're ne- and it's, I don't know. I just, I'm glad you could share that. And I think it's, it's so important because I know I've lost count of how many times I've shared something with Leslie and it's like, oh, okay, this happened. Oh no, I'm so embarrassed. And she's like, oh, I've heard that before. Like, you know, she's a, a counsel, a social worker. It's like, um, you know, it just, we're all just doing the best we can. And we all have seasons that we ride the struggle bus and have winters in our relationship. And we only share about the spring on Instagram. So this is, this is our attempt. This is our, our first shot at at sharing about some of the winter. Thank you so much for your ear today. If you have enjoyed today's podcast, would you do me a favor? Would you please subscribe, rate, and review this podcast in wherever you listen to podcasts? And if you want to go the extra mile, would you please share this podcast wherever you do your social media playtime um, through either Instagram or Facebook or wherever it is. So thank you so much for listening. Until next time. If people saw the road you've been down, they would know. And you'd never feel alone. No, you wouldn't feel wasted. Like an antidote to the world chased by the fear.